Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mike Springston FFC Podcast, where we coach you in the Word. Uh, We're glad to have you with us today from wherever you're listening. Today, we're going to talk about when conversations or messaging, messaging leads one into bondage. We want to welcome you from around the United States and around the world today. And uh, we want you to contact us at springston56 at gmail.com, mikespringstonministries.com, ffcma.org, through Family Fellowship Chapel's direct messaging. We had a wonderful email today uh, from uh, one of our uh, followers, uh, one of those who is who are studying along with us um, and uh, uh, ministering in his part of the world um, and um, I believe it's Pakistan, yes it is, who's following along with us, and we're so glad to hear from you, and uh, we pray that God will open doors of ministry to you and for you. Um, we would appreciate hearing from you at any one of those locations. Um, we also want to remind you of our book, I Surrender, It's in uh, uh, your local bookstores, or you can get it through Amazon. I think it'll bless you. Today, we're going to talk about when conversation leads to bondage, when the messaging of the day leads to bondage. That's where we're going with this study. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Open our eyes that we can see, our ears that we can hear, and our heart that we can understand what the Word of God says to us. And then... May we apply it to our lives so that we can be changed in the image of your dear Son. Jesus, speak to us now, I pray, in the lovely name of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Show us what we need to know, do, understand, and demonstrate. We'll receive it and reveal it and release it to your people. and We'll be blessed because of what we hear from you. We ask it in the lovely name of Jesus Christ, who is our High Priest, our Lord, and our Man in the Godhead. Amen and Amen. Look at James 3, 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity or lawlessness, in-depth wickedness. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. You know the messaging, my friends. The messaging is so critical. We have churches growing off of messaging that really has very little biblical emphasis. Messages of self-help, self-motivation, positivity, very little uh, biblical emphasis in reality. The way it's presented and the way it's understood, of course, are crucial to how the messaging is developed and brought to fruition in reality. In our world today, the messages that are being sent are messages that are producing a response that really is unprecedented. The protests that become riots, the anger that becomes volatile, the vitriol that's spewed that seems to galvanize a depth of response from the hearer that would make one think that the issue behind the message has been so deeply burning in the mind of the hearer that we wonder how they would have contained their self to this day. Could it be that the protester, the marcher, and the cheerleader for the events of the day are nothing more than those who are caught up in the moment? It is somewhat similar to the sports fans who went around other sports fans. Well, they become very vocal sports fans. That would add up to the deeply engaged reactions of those who have seemed to gravitate to the messaging of the day. Now, there is some truth in the concept of mass hysteria or mass responding, as people tend to do what the crowd is doing. And that's because, in general, we as a people are more followers than leaders. But there's a deeper reason for the issue that we choose and the messages that we define as the messages that mean something to us. Now watch this in the moment. We're just coming out of 
a time in our country when the mid-year election cycle that involved at least 37 states has just concluded. The elections included both state and local voting. It seems that a flashpoint during this cycle was the issue of abortion and abortion rights. We have a very divided country along this issue. One particular party seems to have assigned much of their party's hopes on the fact that Americans will desire to keep their reproductive rights. I've heard people say, I don't know what is right about this. I don't know what to think about this. I, you know, don't know how to uh, go into this knowing it's such a political battle. Well, we have a very, very divided country because of that. And that division uh, comes in, crosses the lines of liberals and conservatives. Now, bear in mind, these so-called reproductive rights include, uh, but may not be limited to, the elimination of a fetus and the time frame in which that can be accomplished. It is possible in the mind of some women that the elimination of children, and this has been stated in our national news, should occur when the birthing mother determines that the child needs to be eliminated. Well, of course, uh, diving into that is way beyond reproductive rights and, and abortion. How far this frame goes is an issue if it exceeds birth, and that also is at issue. So we have turned our American system of democracy into a system that is now self-determining who is allowed to live and for just how long. And we know that Canada is doing something very similar with their aged uh, with a euthanizing program. Now watch this because in so doing, we have set on fire the course of nature. Human nature desires to serve themselves with the exhilaration of things. Intercourse is no different. But intercourse without the idea of why intercourse was designed and how intercourse will create life, um, well, we are setting on course the fire of nature without the concept of the outcome. Life is not important now, but your personal self-satisfaction is. So are we really speaking of reproductive rights while discussing this narrative? In my opinion, not really. We're discussing the right to pleasure oneself with any partner and then remove the consequence of the pleasurable experience. And in my opinion, that's not reproductive rights. It's a kind of what has been bantered around as a genocide that becomes a matter of convenience. However, as citizens of this great country, we do not by any stretch of the imagination begin to have the insight as to what the narrative is devising or could potentially cause in the near future. Let's take a look at it. The next statement is a documented fact. Margaret Sanger developed abortions for the specific purpose of altering the percentage of a particular people group. We know that to be the African Americans. Therefore, on many streets uh, and corners in the communities that are high in uh, the African American population, clinics are placed. It's clear why they're strategically placed in these locations. They're readily and easily available for those living in that location. However, abortion has become a modern woman's narrative. Why? Because they do not desire to be told who they can sleep with and what they're allowed to do with the resulting pregnancy if one should occur. We live in a world now that is strafed with mental health disorders where people are doing all kinds of strange and weird activities and we're blaming everything in the world, you know, the guns, how many bullets and all of that. I asked a preacher one time, 
uh, what gun did Cain kill Abel with? And he said, I have to get back to you with that. Uh, <laughs> but we refuse to identify that the need for physical companionship of an intimate level without emotional attachment is a sign of impending mental health issues. Things such as self-worth, self-awareness, and personal value become an issue when we experience non-committal free love. The value of the woman becomes lessened. The value of the male is enhanced as he achieves conquest and control over another human being. So in essence, we desire to treat this mental health issue, throw money at the mental health situation, while exacerbating the issue under another system of messaging. This mixed messaging seems to go unnoticed as we proclaim our right to mix up our mind and emotions and then have a governmental program attempt to untangle the mix-up. As I go through this today, the outcome of receiving this mixed messaging will become abundantly clear. Now, we as a people do not express the insight of how this mixed messaging is being given and what the potential of that mixed messaging is. The result of exercising this freedom is going to leave a mark. It will expose the mind and emotions to the high of self-satisfaction and the low of that self-satisfaction being absolutely unattached. No relationship, no soft tenderness, no let's build something together. Just on to the next one. Rejection equals rejection. And then it begets another rejection. In comes the messaging of freedom to handle my body any way I choose. However, the body has already been abused mentally. This is a very sad commentary, but one that the political messaging dismisses, doesn't even discuss. The political commentary will come in on the back end and provide a program for your mental health problems. Now, let's look at this albatross that we know as abortion. The timeline of abortions began in the 1850s, but, in the, but by 1973, Roe v. Wade legalized abortion as part of the 14th Amendment. Since then in this country, over 63 million abortions have been legally performed. The data shows that those experiencing abortion are in fact not just the African American. But there is a high percentage of white women and Hispanic women who complete the abortion process. Now consider this. By 1995, those who were aborted in the earliest of legalized abortions would have graduated from college. From that point forward, every aborted baby, year by year, would have become of age to enter the workforce. They would potentially work, pay taxes, pay Social Security, and be involved in the funding of their local and state financial agencies. 1.26 million members of the society were discarded yearly. Not to mention the atrocious things that we hear coming from these clinics with regard to the saleable use of these discarded babies. Now we come into our day. We're constantly reminded of the vol volatility of Social Security. We're reminded of how the funds are dwindling. Some say by the early 2030s, that fund will run dry. Well, that's a sad commentary when people have worked and paid into this federal fund for years. Now, wait a minute. Let's look at the bigger agenda. If we expunge those who can pay into the plan to help protect us as we age, then what's actually being done here? 
Has someone determined that they could use abortion as an agenda item, use language to cause women to rally around the cause, while using the same issue to continue their political control? Well, that sounds simple, doesn't it? But it is much deeper than just political control. We have usurped the position of God in our society and replaced it with government. So what does government do? They use a complicit court to reveal, repeal a faulty law. This law opens the floodgates of verbiage that seems to have the idea of empowering women. So what is the idea here? As with all regimes or ideologies, there is an appeal to those who would be considered the malcontents of the day. We've seen it with such things as Black Lives Matter. We've seen it with those entering through the southern border, supposedly to remove themselves from a country that does nothing for them. We have seen it through the Palestinian uprisings. We've seen it through the gay and lesbian pandering. And now we see it through the narrative of abortion. So what are we really seeing? Well, we're seeing a country being pulled into the grips of socialism. Abortion dictates socialism. Why? Because if we abort those who could work and help maintain the lifestyle that's been planned and used to this point, who will pay for the future of those who remain? <laughs> well, the government will have to. Now, some say that we are importing a workforce to do the things that people in this country refuse to do. Although this seems like it would be a sensible and even an accurate statement, but this workforce does not pay taxes. Therefore, they become an economical drain on those who are working and who are paying taxes. So unwittingly, we are led like sheep to a narrative that entraps the society in poverty. How will that happen? It'll happen when the working class becomes so diminished that the government must swoop in to provide for the things of which you have eliminated your means to provide for yourself. We see that currently in the mixed message of the emotional attachment and then unattachment the lack of self-value and the lack of self-worth, the lack of ability, ability to self-advocate, that then results in abortion. Then the mental health issues that result because of it. And the spiral and continued cycle of an attempt to find someone to care. And the middle anguish that comes with it, and the government comes in, as our brother in Chicago has done and says, we will throw money at this mental health issue. All of a sudden, the government begins to make provision. How did it happen? It came from a mixed message. The mind got blurred. The thoughts got blurred because of mixed messaging. On the one hand, they tell you, do what you want to do with yourself. Do what you want to do with your body. It's yours to do with, and we'll support you to do it. Then, as the mental mind, will, and emotion become affected, then they swoop in with a program to attempt to heal your mental health. Well, uh, obviously, those plans have uh, very little legitimate impact on a positive nature, and our, you know, dealing with the psyche of man is something that we do not and have not done a very good job with in terms of the medical community. So unwittingly, we are following a narrative that entraps us in the society of, of poverty and is leading us into a society where socialism, government control, government programs, government handouts are going to be the way that the society has to be run. When this occurs, a new type of governmental structure that we are accustomed to becomes the order of the day. They give what they say you need and you live what they say that you require. You live from what they say you require. 
you're medically cared for as they say that you should be cared for and you live as long as you are useful to the things that they need you for. Now, we didn't identify this when they began to push the abortion narrative or any of the other narratives that reduced the fabric of the society into ruins. We just saw a cause that we had a strong feeling about. We didn't identify that there was a snake in the weeds. I've often wondered why Eve would turn down the blessing of God for a narrative such as the one she went after. Then I found the scripture that describes the one who produced the narrative. Ezekiel chapter 28 in verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of the tablets and of the pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity, in-depth wickedness, or lawlessness was found in thee. He was full of a quick tongue that seemed to speak sense. He was beautiful to look upon and therefore very easy to engage. His words were full of a wisdom that seemed to make sense to her and to resonate with her on a very conscious level. Surely God did not tell you not to partake of the tree of good and evil. Do you know why? Because he knew that when you ate of that tree, you would be equal to him. Think about that. At my fingertips is equality with God. This beautiful creature must be correct. He speaks with a calm assurance. You know, I could be equal with God. I have done what I have done before him, and it seemed to be well uh, within his scope of appreciation. Why, if I can do these things that he has set me out to do, am I not able to be equal with God? God just does not want me to be equal. That's why he denies my access. God wants to just make me do the work and to make me take care of this terrible garden. But I am much more powerful than that Eve might be saying in her mind. At my fingertips is the power of which I crave. I can, by doing what he says, have all of the control and power that I have seen in him. Well, let me eat. Of course, the narrative failed. That kind of narrative always does. Just as it did for Satan. As beautiful as he was and as wise as he had been created to be, he was cast out of heaven. His wisdom had enslaved him. Think about that. His own wisdom had enslaved him. That's the message we're missing in the narratives of our day. As wise and as beautiful as we desire to see ourselves, the narrative of the day to which we align ourselves is in fact enslaving us. We are coming under bondage and being held captive by a message that is not being revealed in its fullness or even in its truth. Because we're not being told about the middle duress, we're not being told about the lack of self-worth. We're not being told about the lack of personal integrity. We're not being told about the future financial disruption that this albatross of abortion causes. We're not being told about all of the undergirding things that the society requires that are being pulled out 
piece by piece from under us and from under those of you who are in that framework of time where this messaging seems so important to you. Satan's messaging was, follow me. I want to be God. Eve's message was to Adam, follow me. I want to be as God. Adam's message was, I followed her, and it led me to nakedness. Satan's message was, follow me. I want to be God. Eve's message was, follow me. I want to be as God. Adam's message was, I followed her, and it led me to nakedness. Listen and learn, my friends. If you follow the language of our day, you've received the narrative and determined to accept it as truth and make it active in your belief system, you will fall into the same place that God found Adam. He said, Adam, where art thou? What have you done? Adam said, I hid myself because I realized I was naked. The hiding from his surroundings because he was naked. He was afraid and he was in fear. Why? Because the world which he once knew was no longer available to him. His eyes were opened, but they were opened too late to stop the problem. Our society is fast approaching this place. We're being spoken to by those who seem to speak in wisdom and seem to have a very beautiful message. But their message is a message of selfishness. Now, when Satan spoke to Eve, he was speaking in her interest, so she thought. But in reality, Satan was speaking in his own interest. Of course, we can easily see that his conversation was leading her to follow him in his designed method, in his desire to fulfill the seed of God. His desire was the complete control of man. Then he could sit on the throne of man's life and be their God of darkness. So should we step back and take a breath and look at the messaging of the day with a bit of a critical eye? Of course we should. Because the messaging of the day is not in our best interest. It's in the best interest of those who desire to maintain, who seek power and control. They pit us against each other on issues of the moment without ever injecting the insight of the long-term ramifications. Well, of course, that messaging is never discussed. So we pick the target, we go after it, we personalize it, and we freeze it. Those come from Salalinsky's Rules for Radicalism. This rule is a hard, fast one with respect to the narratives that seem to be deepening in our country. We pick the target, which seems to be abortion, could be racial divide or even immigration. We broaden the front until the target area becomes so vast for those who are under attack to maintain the many narratives. It, it, it's deeper than the conservative can cross the boundaries of each one of them to try to fix the narrative. But then... We centralize the focus and we take it off the broader issues and boil it down to one major ideal. What wins and what loses? Now we have thoroughly confused the society. We have people on all sides questioning what is correct, what's right, what, we, what must we do, what must we coalesce to in order to take back power. Can we agree on the time frame for abortion? Can we determine that abortion within parameters is acceptable? Now the conservatives begin to seek a solution. Then a candidate makes a statement that seems to have some natural wisdom. What is the result? More confusion.
But the rules that define this are very well and much in operation. The messaging of nakedness is alive and well. Here it is. We would rather have power in the political arena by eating the fruit of the tree than risk losing. With this scenario, even when you win, you lose. Lastly, the issue is simple. People need to stop listening and begin discerning. It's easy to hear and determine your side of what you hear. That side, based upon what we hear, may not be accurate. A bit of thinking and meditating on the information and how what it is about uh, to be done will impact the future is the thing that inquiring and inquisitive people should want to know. But we do not. Why? Because we've been brainwashed to follow. We have been fed the ideas of those who would sacrifice what we want the most for what they make us think we want in the moment. Dangerous and serious are not strong enough words to describe the result that awaits this sort of response. Ask Adam and Eve. If you don't believe them, ask those of our friends who are German. If you don't believe them, ask the Chinese. If you don't believe them, ask the Jews. If you don't believe them, ask the Cubans. We could go on and on with this, these analogies, but the point is made. Nowhere in the world that this messaging has been adopted has ever developed into anything that ultimately ascribes to the freedoms of which the narratives of the day are espousing. Actually, it's quite the contrary. The freedoms to speak, vote, live freely are eliminated from the landscape. We don't see it because we're not privileged to hear the truth from the inside of the countries whose ideologies our messaging is ultimately generated. So it seems to me that we live in a garden of blessings with the concept of care as our charge. However, if we listen to the wisdom and see the beauty of the message and the messengers, then we will eventually open our eyes to our own nakedness. Of course, for the unbeliever, of course, rather for the believer, there is coming a day when Jesus will return for, the, uh, for us. But for the unbeliever, you're ushering in that day by your living in the narrative of the moment. Here are your options. Get right with God and see the messaging for what it is. Trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and prepare to hear the sound of the trumpet. Or be deceived and continue with your natural responses to your self-determination as you being your own God. And you will be left naked and undone. Whichever position you choose, the ultimate outcome has already been determined in terms of you're either going to know God and be saved or you're not going to know Jesus Christ and be condemned. So that outcome is already pressing. Who walks in under the non-condemnation because of the blood of Christ is still open. Those that are believing not are condemned already. The narratives of our day are a part of those dominoes. God, however, is in control. The history of the moment proves this very fact. We need to get right with God and do it now. Thus saith the God of the universe, the calamities that you are under. I have to laugh. I see you in disarray and I laugh at your derision. You've left me and turned from me. I gave you the fat of the land and you made the land your God. I gave you the prosperity of the day and you made prosperity your God. I gave the spirit of life and you made death your God. So I will laugh at your derision. I will have to mock your folly. I will look upon you with disdain because you choose darkness and death over life and peace. I am the God of the universe and I will not be mocked, saith the Lord. Father, I pray that you will bless, open our eyes, put this message in the hands of those that need to hear it. Put it in the hearts of those that need to preach it. May we come to realize the deception of the day. And may we come to understand that you are the only answer. You are the only answer. 
I ask it all in the lovely name of Jesus Christ, who is my high priest, my Lord, and my man in the Godhead. Amen and amen. If you'll find him as Lord, you'll find him as being over everything. Find him as the man in the Godhead, and he'll speak to you and show you great and mighty things to come. With a heavy heart for the direction of the people and with a heavy heart for the messaging that people are following. I'm going to tell you that I'll be back to talk to you about the Word of God. But my prayer will continue to be that the light of Jesus Christ shine in to the darkness and life and peace become the reality for every individual while there's time for light and peace to be shared. May God bless you until we speak again.